Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell. I just finished a really, really interesting chat with um, Professor Herman Ponza from Duke University in the US. Um, he has this uh, concept, which is that when you exercise or even physical activity, you do not actually change your total energy expenditure for the day compared to someone who just sits on a couch all day. He's saying that your energy expenditure tends to be in a narrow range. And that when you exercise, what happens is that you reduce your energy expenditure um, throughout the day by affecting perhaps your basal metabolic rate or other processes that we discuss. So it's a bit of a, a mind boggling concept, um, but here's data from uh, humans and animals, including actual modern day hunter gatherers from Tanzania, et cetera, that show that um, their physical activity does not affect their total energy expenditure. So he essentially is saying that um, diet is what affects your body composition and exercise, although you know, very important for your health, does not affect your, um, your body weight. So it's a bit of a challenge to get your head around. And as you can see, I was very much a devil's advocate, but uh, Herman was really you know, delightful throughout. He didn't have any problems, any defensiveness, any ego uh, with you know, discussing these uh, concepts with me challenging him etc and uh, i think you'll find this really interesting so stick around anyway my background is ex exercise metabolism and i do a lot of exercise used to be a distance runner whatever and uh i have a hard time <laughs> getting my head around accepting you know your main premise, yes fine right good let's do it uh, I, I uh I, I came out of the same not so different than you did i did my phd work measuring energy expenditures of walking and running uh in humans and goats and dogs and chimpanzees and everything else and yeah. uh, and and the whole point of the first work i did with the hadza community was that we would be you know using uh, understanding how much how many calories they burn it'll be some crazy amount of calories because you know they're really physically active and i'm a very good handle on on just how expensive that can be because i measured it on treadmills a bunch um so yeah i your your disbelief uh, can only match my own <laughs> suspect. Yeah, because <laughs> I saw your original paper in 2012 and plus plus uh, uh, was yeah was... the first paper on the first paper on subsistence culture yeah. is energetics. That's right. That's right. The first hunter gatherer measurements. That's right. Yeah, and you were assuming that the, their physical activity would be you know higher and and increase their total energy expenditure, but you didn't get that. So so you started off probably where I'm at now, to be honest, which is yeah. like what the hell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I can tell you that story a bit if that's interesting to you. But yeah. So, um, yeah, it, I'm, you know, I'm a human evolutionary biologist, right? I'm mm -hmm. trained in human evolution. I'm trained in uh, human physiology and biomechanics and that kind of stuff. But it's all oriented towards, or at least to all be oriented towards understanding how humans evolved, where we come from, mm -hmm. and how sort of ecological and evolutionary changes in our past have produced these weird bodies we have today. Um, I was very interested in those questions. I remain interested, interested in those questions. And we wanted to go and measure um, energy, daily energy expenditures in a hunting and gathering community mm -hmm. because that's how humans evolved, right? We evolved yeah. hunting and gathering for 2 million years plus. And, you know, no, no population today is, you know, is a time machine. We're all equally modern humans, you know, with equally modern human bodies. But um, if you have a culture that, that still hunts and gathers, um, in these wild landscapes, are, that's the uh, one nice window to ask, how would my body, how would my body work? How would it function? What would the physiology be mm -hmm. in that kind of a community, right? With that kind of lifestyle. And I'd spent my PhD work measuring energy expenditures and walking and running. So I knew how expensive that was. And I thought, well, they're, they're really physically active. Mm -hmm. uh, we know this. And so let's go and, and just see, you know, how many calories are burning per day. Uh, because it must be really high compared to what folks in the US and Europe and Japan and other industrialized yeah. countries that had been measured are doing. And so um, it turned out nobody had done it before. Nobody had measured energy expenditures in the hunting and gathering community before. Uh, and so I got the best technique to do that, the doubly labeled water method. I, I learned enough to be able to implement that in the field. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, now we do that in our lab. That we, we, we do it all in-house now. But at the time, I was just learning this technique working with Bill Wong, who's one of the leaders in, uh, in that technique in the US. Uh, got the doses ready, got everything ready to go. Spent a year getting permits, 
um, and shipped off to North Northern Tanzania, which is the, where this community, the Hadza community lives. Mm -hmm. So the Hadza are a hunting and gathering community. Men hunt, women gather. It's the kind of classic textbook story. Um, men also collect a lot of wild honey, it turns out. But it's a really physically active lifestyle. So men and women are getting you know, five to 10 times more physical activity every day than a typical American, for example. Um, we measured energy expenditures using the doubly labeled water technique in about 30 adults, men and, and women. Got the, the samples home, because of course, if, if you don't, if your listeners don't know, this is an isotope tracking technique that measures the total production of carbon dioxide over about a week. I think we did our measurements over 10 days. Um, and so you come home with urine samples to get measured for isotope enrichments and that then you calculate the CO2 productions. Uh, and I got the data back from Bill Wong who ran all of our samples for us. Uh, and I had them plotted up against, you know, these other data from other, other published studies that people had published, you know, individual level data for, for daily energy expenditures. And it's the same, you know, it was like a total shock. If you look at fat-free mass against, or any measure of body size for that matter, but fat-free mass is the best one. Fat-free mass against daily calories, um, Sure enough, it, the, the Hadza and the US and UK and Australia, I suppose. I, I mean, any industrialized folks you put up against there, it's they're all in the same, they're all in the same cloud of points. So uh, that was a, the first shock to us. And I remember emailing with Bill Wong about this and asking, first of all, how we messed something up. You know, that's <laughs> what I assumed. Assume, first yeah, of all, yeah, we screwed yeah. it up. Mm -hmm. He said, no, no, the data looked fine. I said, well, Bill, can you explain to me how it's possible? that these men and women with the Hadza community are getting so much activity and they're not burning any more calories than folks in the US mm -hmm. and he goes, oh yeah, yeah, oh no, that's, we see that sometimes. He says, they're more efficient. I said, oh, right. thank God, somebody understands how this works. How, what do you mean they're more efficient? And he goes, well, they don't burn as many, as many calories as you'd expect for how active they are. And right. I said, right, well, that, that's what I said to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said, you said, no, but that's what, you know, and I said, well, so, you know, it, it said to me that there's actually no, there's no really good handle on why this happens. Um, and so that's led me down this road the last 10 or 12 years, trying to understand that. Uh, yeah. First of all, trying to replicate it, trying to, to test it, trying to see it and, and trying to understand how that can happen. Wow. So actually just how, did, why did he even think that was the case already? If it hadn't been done, how did that, how did he... Oh, no. Well, I mean, it was just his point as somebody who spent a lifetime measuring energy expenditures, Bill Wong, okay. was that, you know, he'd seen it before where you get populations that are more physically active. But when you actually measure the calories, it doesn't break out the way that you'd expect. Yeah, yeah. You know, his his work was never focused on that question. Exactly. He'd done a lot of other work in like pregnancy and nutrition, that kind of stuff. And so he'd never published on that. But, you know, it was kind of an open I open secret's not the right word, but it's kind of an understanding of people who actually measure energy expenditures, daily expenditures, that you don't always get this co correspondence between how active people are and, and how many calories they burn. So he wasn't shocked by it. Um, I was, which just, I think, reflects my naivete going into the, the, pro the project. Right. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, it is really it, it is really a hard one to get your head around. Yeah. So, I mean, just being selfish for a minute. Yes, yeah. so I, you know, I, I'm quite proud of the fact I think I've got 212 days in a row or something of cycling, you know, an hour a day, not just, you know, not just like turning my legs over, but, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know 25, 30 kilometers an hour, whatever that is in American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And then also doing 10,000 steps a day. But you're, yeah. but you're saying, so your theory essentially is yeah. that the, that what I've, what I'm doing with that is not actually affecting my energy expenditure over the full day because um, the rest of the time I'm using less energy and therefore my energy expenditure is no different to someone who's just sitting on the couch all day. That, that, is yeah. That yeah, that's, I mean, that's the observation that comes from work with people like the Hadza. That you can yeah. be as active as you are and you'd have the same expenditures as somebody who's not. Now, okay. Let's ask about the details then, because you're uh, specifically asking about someone who's doing a lot of physical activity. So mm -hmm. you're pushing it as hard as, you know, you're pushing it every day. Mm. Uh, and that's good. Um, is there, the, the idea behind the constrained energy model is that the body responds to habitual activity levels in a way that kind of keeps your energy expenditures in a narrow range. So activity is going to have a pretty blunted effect 
on daily expenditure um, over the long long haul because the bodies adjust. Now, there has to be some limit to how much a body can adjust, right? Mm -hmm. um, we are working with ultra marathoners right now who run, um, you know, probably run 100 kilometers a week, if not more. And and on some you know some events they're doing, um, they just did. We have measurements in our lab from folks who just did a 250 mile run, and mm -hmm. I think it took them a couple of days, uh, three days, something like that. Look. If you're pushing it that hard, then yeah. that's probably past the ability of the body, past the body's ability to adjust. So in your specific case, Glenn, we can measure it, be happy to do it. We get you enrolled in this study, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I'm not He's sure. What I, what, I can juke, bet, yeah. what I would be, what I would be willing to put uh, a friendly wager on is that your daily energy expenditure isn't as high as you'd expect just based on, you know, if you take the, the background data, a man your age, your body size composition, tack on top of that all the exercise you're doing and we could predict how many calories you ought to be burning every day and i would i would be very happy to wager that it's much less than that because your body is adjusting to that higher level of, of activity yeah so so how high could that go because you know if you're talking about yeah because you know um javier i don't know if it's javier or xavier gonzalez i was interacting mm. with him he's coming on the podcast next and he yeah. was saying how the minnesota starvation experiment show that uh, they reduce their resting metabolic rate by about 600 calories a day. Yeah. Yeah. Kilocalories. Yeah. So, so are you suggesting that you could, uh, this compensation could reduce it by more than that? Because it uh, would seem I'm not to sure. be. Yeah. I suspect that the, the cushion might be in the same ballpark. So here's the only project I know that's, that's looked at this in a way that that gets that number that you're asking about. What's the total cushion you could in, expect to compensate. Uh, we had people who ran across North America. Mm -hmm. So these folks ran from, um, it was called the race across the USA. It was a foot race. I guess there's a bicycle version of this sometimes, yes. but this is a, a uh, this is a foot race version, which I think it's only been done one other time. Uh, they ran with their, you know, they had their feet on the sand on the shores of the Pacific on day mm -hmm. one. And five months later, they were in Washington, D.C., which for those who aren't clear on their geography, that's across the entire North American continent. It took them five months. And they ran a marathon a day, six days a week. Uh, towards the end, they did it just seven days a week because they weren't on track or whatever. Um, and we measured their energy expenditures. And so we had their baseline the week before they started running. Well, before they started racing, they still, they, these are people who run all the time. So they're still running during that baseline. And then we had them in the first week of the event doing a marathon a day. And we know how much running costs. Like I said, I've studied this before in my own work, it's well studied. Mm -hmm. We know, you know, roughly speaking is hundred kilocalories a mile. So we know that the change in mileage should predict the change in expenditure from before the event to the first week. And sure enough, the first week it matches perfectly, right? By the end of five months, we measured it again now their expenditures are still higher than the typical American because they're running a marathon a day. So yes, you can go beyond the body's ability to compensate, mm -hmm. right? But it's 600 calories less, 600 kilocalories less per day uh, than we'd expect based on week one measurements and, and even you know based on the prior, the, the pre-race and the week one measurements. And so even in that case, the body is finding 600 kilocalories or so to spare. Um, it's, okay. it's interesting. It didn't show up in their basal metabolic rates as far as we can measure it. Uh, it could have been in sort of spontaneous physical activity. It could have been in other stuff the body does throughout the day. Um, we can talk about that if you like, but it's but it was 600 calories missing. Uh, from okay, so that's kind of like, I guess that that stress on the body is sort of almost like a starvation study, isn't it? Because you, you, you just, you yeah. know, so it's interesting I mean, it matches up with that data. It does. It, what, one curious thing, though, I'd say is, because we've had this question before, and I saw somebody put this on Twitter. It's a good question. Is it the same phenomenon? Mm -hmm. um, is starvation response, starvation compensation the same as exercise compensation? Yeah. It, they probably share a lot of the same physiologies. That's how the body works. A lot of stuff gets shared. But I don't think it's exactly the same phenomenon for this reason. If you look at Minnesota starvation study, or you look at, for example, Kevin Hall's analysis of the biggest losers, uh, biggest loser uh, study. The people who 
lo lose the most weight in those studies have the greatest amount of compensation, right? They've, their BMRs are, are changed the most. Um, in an exercise intervention study, like for example, uh, Midwest 2, which is one that where uh, men and women were given either a 2000 kilocalorie a week or a 3000 kilocalorie a week dose of exercise. If you look at the people whose weights changed a lot, you know, measurably versus those who's, who did not change at all, uh, the ones who didn't change at all were the ones who showed the most compensation. Their total energy expenditures were basically identical to they were, they were where they were at baseline. Um, the people who lost weight were the ones whose total energy expenditures didn't change. I'm uh, sorry, sorry. The ones who, who lost yeah, weight yeah. were the ones whose total energy expenditures changed like you'd expect them to, I should say. Okay. And so that seems to me like compensation is working differently because the people who lose the weight have the most compensation in a, in a diet study. The people who don't lose the weight have the most compensation in an exercise study. Yeah, right. Is it fair to say though, I read somewhere that... Um... I, hold on one second. Are you... They're doing work on my house, which is why I'm in the basement. Uh, <laughs> and I, I I hear them sometimes. I don't know if you're hearing them too. I'm actually not on. hearing it, thankfully. Oh, perfect. These these things are amazing. These... Uh, it is iPhone headphones. Wow. That's great. As long as you're not hearing it, picking it up, I'm I'm happy. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah. So the Midwest Exercise Two study, I, I read somewhere that <clears throat> that that only a small subset actually had their total energy expenditure measured the with the W label water. Is that fair to say? Uh, uh, no, maybe it's maybe you're thinking of Midwest One, which might have had less. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I don't think that's true. Okay. Um, there's yeah, someone. Someone I emailed about it said that said um, ask him about that. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. Yeah. Well, have a look, have a look at that and see. Maybe you can respond on Twitter or something. Yeah. So I guess I guess that's the thing. Well, I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, methodological uh, bits and pieces about the double mm -hmm. level water or whatever. But the interesting thing with the biggest loser, I was actually thinking about. I didn't realize there'd been a study done on that. They have like ridiculous. I mean, I know it's not you know, the, the least bit realistic and they're not, they're not yeah. really going to hold it, you know, after they finish the show generally. But yeah. they have massive reductions in in, in weight, right? And and I was just thinking, yeah. surely it couldn't just come down to them eating less. You know, it has to be the fact that they're burning yeah. up lots of calories. But you're saying... No, I, I think so. There, so a few things there. One is... Uh, I don't think there's any realistic version of this constrained model that, that says you compensate the same day or tomorrow or even within a couple yeah, of weeks. Time, I think it takes yeah. a while to adjust. Right. So I think though, you know, and if you look at when how people lose weight in an exercise intervention, the ones who do, which isn't everybody, but the ones who lose any weight, they all lose it in the first month or so. And then after that, you can have it go a month, you can have it go six months, you can have it go a year, weight very much plateaus. Um uh so I think, you know, that's kind of in the, mm -hmm. during the adjustment period, you're seeing, you know, expenditures are going to be higher. Just like that first week of the people running across the USA, right? For that first week, there was no compensation. Their energy expenditures matched exactly what you'd expect okay. if you stuck a marathon on top of their baseline levels. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that that, and also probably there, I mean, it was a really extreme amount of exercise. It probably was, even if you had somehow been able to maintain it for, for six or eight months, probably beyond the body's ability to compensate i mean and you know you mentioned is, you know yeah. you mentioned there's also a race it's called race across america they do every every year pretty much the cycling one that oh, would yeah. be interesting to look at because they they go nuts they do it in like seven i think seven days is the record so they wouldn't yeah. even have time to like compensate no i'm sure they don't um, compensate that would like be that. i bet mad. that's right yeah, yeah yeah okay well we'd like to do it so one other thing we've published is is this question about well you know, if you can, if you are able to push beyond the kind of typical behavioral, psychological things and, and physiological uh, constraints that, that would try to keep your energy expenditure within a normal, quote unquote, normal range, uh, you know, habitual expenditures adjusting to a habitual activity levels, what is it about the 1% of folks who's, who are pushing like mad to, to, to go beyond that, right? And the Michael Phelps of the world and the ultra marathoners of the world, um, it, that are that are beyond the body's ability to compensate because humans are are a really interesting species you know we can do things and do that push our normal physiology past you know it's sort of normal settling points you know it, uh, yeah, yeah. 
And so that's really fun because you can test a lot about the physiology that way. When you look at that, there seems to be this sort of um, pretty hard limit on what the body can do in terms of calories burned per day that seems to be related to the duration of the event. So if you do a 100 mile ultramarathon run or a Kona Ironman, it's about a half day thing if you're fast, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, you can burn, I forget what it is, something like 10 times your basal metabolic rate. I might not have that exactly right, but something like that uh, for that one, one day or so event. You do the Tour de France, it's more like four times your basal metabolic rate is a maximum you can do, and that's about a month long event. Uh, the folks who we had running across North America are a good example of something that at that time frame, about five months, they were about three times their basal metabolic rates. Uh, pregnancy, right? This is a fun mm. one. Nobody's ever done anything that took more calories per day for longer uh, than pregnancy. Nine months is about you know 2.2 uh, times your basal metabolic rate, something like that. And so we keep on trying to find people to break the ceiling, right? We mm. we think that this is a real a real limit to what human the human body can do. Um, and so it'd be great to get those seven day uh, that seven day event for people going across the U.S. Because I'd love to see it. If, it's, if if anybody can break that ceiling, it should be them. Hey, I'm just thinking again, because because it kind of comes across a little bit that uh, you you basically, if you're doing like just normal physical activity, then essentially um, that's having no no real effect on your energy expenditure. But you know your yeah. Carew paper with about a million authors um, from yeah right sure from last year, uh, you know that it, it, they found that it was something like twenty eight percent of the physical activity was. Yeah. So that still means that, okay, so 28% was constrained, I guess you'd say, yeah? Well, the, the, yeah, but in that same paper, there's mm -hmm. a within subjects analysis. So that's, you're talking about the between subjects analysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so cross-sectionally, it's about 28%. If you look at within subjects, right, if you look at the same person measured today mm -hmm. and then measured again in a year, and you look at how the, the different components of their energy budget are changing, mm -hmm you see compensation of closer to 100% between the amount spent on activity and the amount spent on basal metabolic rate. Um, so is it 100% in every case? Surely not, but that's that, that's closer to 100% in that within subjects analysis. Okay, but but, it, but across the average, maybe I'm losing you there. So across the uh, the average was 28%, yeah? So they were saying 72% was... Uh, Cross-sectionally then. So that's like, if yeah. we look at somebody who is, yeah, so you're right. So it's not 100% in the cross-sectional thing. So if I compare mm. people of different activity levels, um, maybe I'll see some small effect of, you know, some effect of, of, ex, of activity on their expenditure. Um, yeah, that's, so we can get into the details of how that's done. Mm -hmm. um, they're not actually saying that total energy expenditure has increased very much because you're actually using total energy expenditure as a, as a way to get at activity and energy expenditure. If you look at other approaches, uh, other analyses that have actually measured daily energy, daily activity with accelerometry, for example, mm -hmm. um, you see the effect on, on daily energy expenditure is much, much less. And so that's what we'd expect. We'd expect that if you go from completely, you know, sedentary to doing something that there can be some increase there in the sort of very low end of activity. If you're, you know, basically bedridden and you begin to be more active the body isn't going to compensate to that because you're so far left of, of what, you know, of, of where that you're pushing the body to compensate, but then very quickly the body begins to plateau out and you begin to adjust internally. Okay. And what was the idea in that same paper that, you know, we're talking about the 28% or whatever, what was the right. idea that, that the ones that the people that were quite overweight, had quite a high, high fat mass, they were more like 50%. What was the thinking there? Yeah, uh, so if you look at, if you use that, again, it's a cross-sectional measure of, of compensation. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure it's the best approach, but um, I think the within subjects design is stronger. Uh, mm -hmm. But cross-sectionally, um, you see that people who have more body fat compensate more. So that would suggest that um, that, that compensation might contribute even to their- yeah, So it's even harder for them to- Yeah. It's even harder for them to have a positive effect of exercise. That's, that's the idea, yeah. It's funny, actually, because I just thought about glucose, because I've done a lot of stuff with glucose uptake during exercise and whatever. Yeah. And you know, people with type 2 diabetes, during the exercise, they'll go, oh, here's a chance. I, I, it's not like the body says, here's a chance, but yeah. well, it's a chance for the 
body to reduce its glucose. So the glucose actually goes down during the exercise. So we're not talking about, mm -hmm. you know, increased insulin sensitivity later. So it's the chance for a body to go, oh, let's rectify this problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. But in this situation, you've got people that are overweight, which is not good for your health, just like diabetes and you know, and often, yeah. often, often they have both. But that, but the body doesn't go, oh, here's a chance. You know, we're exercising. Here's a chance to try and lose the weight. It's actually doing the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I think the body, you know, the systems. There's a whole host of ideas out there about why the body even would would ever be evolved to hang on to more body fat than it really needs. Um, uh, but for whatever reason, it just seems to be the case that the, once you've got that fat, the body does not like to lose it. Um, and you could, you know, that, that could be for a whole host of reasons, sort of evolutionarily or physiologically. We're talking about set points, you're talking about, you know, evolutionary pressures, which is a whole other discussion. But yeah, you, you've got the fat, the body doesn't like to lose it. And so it's, well, you know, I, I think what that says is the pressure has to be on keeping people at a healthy weight, you know, as they grow up and as they grow old rather than trying to fix problems mm -hmm. after they've they've come up. Actually, just I don't know if you're aware of this data, but this is another one that sort of does my head in. My, my head's could have done in lately. Um, I've read this, this studies done in Copenhagen with, with very large groups finding that mm -hmm. the, the optimum BMI for all-cause mortality has been increasing over the last 50 years. So in like 19, in the 1970, it was like 23, 24. Mm -hmm. And then it became 25. And now it's actually 27, which is actually in the overweight range. Yeah, wow. Which is kind of uh, crazy, you know, in the scheme of, you know, evolution. You know, you're the evolutionary biologist, but, you know, in 50 years, somehow the yeah. more cause mortality rate is... That's has, crazy. Has, I'd love to know, yeah, I'd love to know how sensitive they are to, to knowing if it's 23 or 25, because if you look at those funny U-shaped curves of all-cause mortality, I mean, I think it's been known for a while that you don't want to be too underweight. Right. I mean, there's always been a kind of U-shaped curve, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how well you can define where the bottom of a pretty flat U is gets gets tricky. But I mean, I take your word for it. I'm sure, I'm sure the analysis is right. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's um, it's strange, isn't it? I mean, it, it couldn't be, it couldn't really be natural selection happening over that time, could it? It's it's too fast for genes to change and for fitness to affect things. But um, it is strange. I guess it speaks to maybe infection being a bigger cause of mortality than, uh, you know, we're able to fix the things like heart disease, perhaps, or not fix them, but treat them. That might have made it worse for you to be at a higher BMI. And now that leaves the sort of underlying pressure of infectious disease load kind of thing, which is where probably having a higher BMI might save you a bit. Yeah, right. Actually, talking about infection, it made me think of something else. So, you know, I, you know, I said at the start, I'm going to be devil's advocate with things, right? So, yeah, great. Yeah. Um, so, the idea with this constrained model is um, partly that basal metabolic rate or resting metabolic rate decreases when you exercise more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you you did say before that you're running across America. There was no change in the ba yeah. basal metabolic rate and also, I, I thought that the original idea of the Hazda, so the hunter-gatherers in Tanzania, was that they must have lower, but then your latest study found, if anything, they had the same or higher, maybe because of more infections or something. So what so can you... That's, so that's across a different population, but it's a similar context, yeah. so I think that's a fair comparison. Um, the, we've replicated the total energy expenditure findings in a couple of other communities. Uh, the Schwar community in Ecuador, it's a, they do some hunting and gathering and a bit of farming. Um, and we've also done this with the Chimani, which is another uh, hunting and gathering and forager kind of and farming uh, community in Bolivia. Uh, and so the, the, you know, the top line number calories per day doesn't look any different than anybody else, but it's true. They've got actually in those two cases, the Schwar and the Chimani, they've got elevated uh, resting metabolic rates, and if you ask what predicts the elevation in that resting metabolic rate, um, it's you know immune function markers. It's a, it's um, you know things like um, IgG, and if you've had helminths and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah, so what's going on? Well, um, I don't know yet. <laughs> is is the honest answer. Here's what I think is happening, but this is a hypothesis at this point. Um, first of all, when we 
when we take when we measure total energy expenditures, here's something that you that your listeners should know. We measure total energy expenditures. We do that with a technique called doubly labeled water. We can do mm-hmm. it in a metabolic chamber or something like that. But you, that's a that's a one measurement of the total calories burned per day. We take basal metabolic rates, and we do them. Uh, you know, typically sort of seven o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, thermoneutral, fasted, all those things, right? And so that's a very that's a point measurement Mm -hmm. and then we extrapolate that throughout the day and we the assumption is that that's unchanged right and so if we want to know how many calories you spend on activity what we typically do is we take your total expenditure whether you measured we subtract bmr you might subtract out some estimated amount of digestion costs Mm -hmm. right but basically we don't ever really measure activity and expenditures we get them by subtraction by subtracting bmrs from total energy expenditures Okay, we know that basal metabolic rates are not constant throughout the day. We know that they change, they, they fluctuate in a circadian rhythm. Um, we know that activity like stress response, sympathetic tone, that kind of stuff can change throughout the day. Um, we know that your bi- biological systems might have, we know they do have circadian rhythms throughout the day. So mm-hmm. the amount of energy that your immune system takes up might not be the same at 5 a.m. as it is at two in the afternoon. Um, and so there's a lot of moving parts that I think could be where the energy savings comes from in, as the body adjusts and, and energy becomes constrained. And we don't have good measurements of those yet. So that's just a hypothesis. Um, we'd like to get better measurements of them. But I think that's how you would end up being able to un- explain how, um, for example, kids in the Schwar community in Ecuador can have the same energy expenditures, whether they're in a rural, rural community, hunting and gathering, farming with their parents, or are those same kids from the same communities in um, a more urban setting in a small town, small city somewhere where they're going to school and getting their food from the supermarket, or and you compare them to kids in the US and the UK and they have the same energy expenditures there too. Even though activity levels are different, even though basal metabolic rates are actually higher with the most rural kids who are also mm-hmm. the most active, um, yeah, I think basically we just don't understand entirely how calories are spent throughout the day and our very rough measures of it don't capture what's happening enough to, to get at where the computation is coming from. But I don't know that at, at this point, that's the hypothesis. Yeah, it's great. It's great. You've been really you know, transparent about, um, you know, some of these yeah. things that you may not be measuring and may not know, but I guess you could, you could, you could spin that a little bit differently and rather than saying those things you're not measuring or you don't know might explain it. You could also say that those things may are causing errors that that might be messing things up as well, right? So, you know, should, Although, yeah. but they, yeah. they those those errors in those pieces aren't accumulating in a way that will affect total energy expenditure, right? The total energy expenditure measurement is a is an independent measurement of calories per day. Okay, we know what the that's been validated in active and sedentary people. We know that what the precision on it is. We know what the error is on it is. It's sort of plus or minus five percent. And so, um, you know, in a tiny sample, yeah, you, know, you get tiny sample, tiny sample problems. But in a big enough sample, um, no, I don't think that the issue is is the method because it's a well validated method. Yeah. So if you're talking about five percent, I guess it depends on what your uh, expenditure is. But that could be, I don't know, 100, 150 kilocalories a day, right? Right. But so your then then the expectation that the follow on becomes. A high, you're missing five percent. No, no, so, it doesn't mean that. I, I'm not saying right, that. I'm saying you're sort of five percent at the highest level. Yeah, exactly. At the highest level, and so what? But it's if you. That's again why you need good samples because the precision for determining a, a population average, for example, is going to be determined by the measurement error and the sample size, right? So if you have five percent measurement exactly. error, which most respirometry stuff things do. You need good sample sizes to be able to really pinpoint. It should uh, an should kind of come out in the wash, yeah. But yeah, I, I, because I, but I guess the average is yeah. But then I guess it becomes more an average thing rather than an inter individual thing, because you know, in terms of coming out in the wash, yeah, <laughs> that's better if you're doing averages rather than in each individual, because that could be yeah out. But um, you know what I mean. Hopefully, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. you know, I. Uh, I mean, a devil's advocate. That's what I'm doing. That's yeah. my job. 
I, I no, I, I love it. That's fine. But just, as, as the implication, though, is yeah, yeah. wrong, I think. All right. Because the implication is like, well, you've got 5% error, so you don't really know. And the answer is no. 5% error could go either way. We could also be overestimating. Error is error. Exactly. So we could just as likely, Glenn, be overestimating the energy expenditures of someone who's active as we are that's underestimating them. And that's, that's what an average, that's what error is. I wonder if you can clarify. I've done some tracer studies, but I haven't done doubly labeled water. Um, yeah. It's a bit confusing to me anyway. Um, the effect of RER. So I think sometimes you're measuring the spirit exchange ratio and sometimes you're not. And that can make a big difference as well to the calculation as far as I know. Is yeah. that something you try and allow for? Often, often it's, it's very difficult, I'm sure, because you've got to have yeah, spiritual Yeah, so the measures. way that you do it, the best, the best way to handle that is to get detailed dietary records of the people that you're working with, because even an RER, so, so to, for folks who are unsure how that, that plugs in, when you get a measurement of calorie, uh, sorry, of carbon dioxide per day, mm -hmm. then to calculate a calories per day out of that, you need to understand something about the macronutrient breakdown of, of the of what the people are burning yeah. carbs versus fat yeah. and uh and that's will tell you something about the ratio of oxygen consumed to co2 produced um a higher fat diet will have a lower ratio of oxygen consumed to co2 produced higher carbs will have a higher ratio mm -hmm. those ratios vary between 0.7 and 1 um the uh you know the standard american diet the RQ is about 0.86, and that has to do with how much fat we eat, RER. how much carbs we eat. RQ, RER, RQ. RQ, you've got to measure in the blood. Yeah, I've noticed that in a couple of papers. People say RQ, but RQ is when the spiritual question is when you measure in the blood. So you measure the okay. CO2 and the O2. RER is the, the, the proper way of saying. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so RER. So then um, you can measure RERs, you know, when somebody's at, uh, in for a basal metabolic rate measurement, for example. If you use that for the RER for the whole day, that's actually going to bias your, your estimates because as you know, you have much lower RERs at complete rest than you will in the exactly. typical daily life. Uh, and so we don't use those. Um, we can use them to kind of you know, ballpark or, or, or sort of as a check against what we're esti estimating. But what we actually prefer to do is get, again, dietary uh, records for the communities that we work with. Um, and figure out what they're eating. And then that gives you a macronutrient breakdown that you can use uh, yeah. that's better. Because and as long as people are in nutrient, it's a bit, you know, nutrient stable, weight stable, which our people are, uh, then that's what that's the better one to use. That's the food quotient or whatever they call it. Yeah. 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 Now, just, just yeah, that one thing I was wanting to bring up was energy intake, because naturally you've got to think about both sides of the equation. Oh, and, sure, that's, yeah. and that's sort of notoriously hard to measure. Oh, yeah. Even in, yeah, even in uh, rich Western countries and whatever. How do you go about yeah. measuring food intake in hunter-gatherers, you know, accurately? Well, so, yeah, actually, in some ways, it's a better system because um, when we work with the Hadza, for example, we're camped right outside of their camp. We set up a research, little research camp station there with a, a, a way scale and that kind of thing. Um, and every time they come back from foraging, they forage every day. Every time they come back, they stop by our camp weigh the foods that they brought back to camp. Um, we make a note of what it is, how much it weighed. And then it goes into camp and everybody eats it all. I mean, there's not much food waste and, and everybody shares equally. So we know probably better than the typical American household uh, uh -huh. what people are eating. Um, oh, sorry, so they, that, so they bring it back. I thought that I'm imagining these people out walking around just eating berries and things. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> and, there's some bits of that too. There's some of that. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not the bulk of their calories. Um, and it's not a, it's, it doesn't seem to be biased. If anything, it's biased towards plant foods, which would, you know, we would, we'd be underestimating RERs in that case, and then we'd be underestimating expenditures in that case. Sorry, overestimating expenditures. Um, anyway, the, we have measurements of food outside of camp, and we know they're eating outside of camp too. Um, it's not, it's not a huge portion of the diet. Uh, in terms of calories, total calories that they eat, um, the daily energy expenditures that we get from the DLW data, the daily level water measurements, have actually been a real boon to that because uh, it's really hard to know how many calories somebody's eating, even when we have our eyes on people almost all day, like we do when we hang out with the Hadza community. Um, 
But if you know how many calories people are burning every day, and you know if they've gained or lost any weight, then you know how many calories they ate because yes, that's, fair enough. that's, yep, that's yep. how that works. So just thinking again, so people, someone on Twitter said, uh, oh, who was it? I think it was Alex. Um, you're saying, you know, if someone is expending 5,000 calories a day, so, you know, like a serious athlete, yeah. um, and a lot of it's been compensated. So, you know, that it's not adding to their total energy expenditure, then correct. Uh, well, you, you just said that they're ex- burning 5,000 oh, calories a day, which would be above what anybody's going to be. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. If they're, if they're, um, their overall total any expenditure is 5,000 calories a day. So including that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then and then they're eating about that as well. Then sure. surely they should be putting on weight because if they're eating, because, you know, we all know that athletes eat a lot. I guess I don't understand the question because if you're telling oh. me that they're burning 5,000 calories a day and they're eating 5,000 calories a day. Then oh, okay. All right. no I, haven't, I haven't said that very well then. If they exercise, okay. So just person that's training a lot, they yeah. we all know they eat a lot, right? they eat yeah, a lot for sure yeah and but if their if their exercise is being compensated for so that they're not actually increasing their total energy expenditure much then the fact that they eat so much shouldn't they be putting on weight uh yeah anybody who eats more than they burn will gain weight that's true yep uh what i guess what i would say about that is if you're talking about someone who is uh, for example, like the ultra marathon runners who we have in our study, who mm-hmm. are pushing themselves again to run like 100 kilometers a, a week, uh, that's beyond what the body can compensate, and their daily expenditures are going to be above, um, you know, typical American, typical Hadza for that matter, typical active person for that matter, because they're pushing themselves to that elite level. I mean, in your example of somebody burning 5,000 kilocalories a day. Um, we actually have a big database now, 8,000 some measurements of people across the globe. And I can tell you just how rare it is for okay. anyone to be burning 5,000 kilocalories a day. Uh, and so, you know, it's, yes, can, if the question is, can the person be so physically active that they're pushed beyond what the body can compensate to? And, and yeah, it's true. It's possible. We just don't see it very much and we don't see it across populations we don't see sort of an habitual only, activity but earlier you said it's probably only about 600 kilocalories a day so someone that's swimming you know twice a day or whatever in a training camp but not okay not a training camp but just people that swim every day people that run 10 miles a day so as you said that's about a thousand kilocalories um you know they they would have to be um you know <laughs> i can, I, I think i know what you're saying if you're yeah, they just they, 10, they have to time have miles to be, a day yeah, yeah. Running ten miles, like what? What is the amount of, that you can run before you can't compensate any further? Right. So, if you're running ten miles a day, mm-hmm. let's do this thought experiment, mm-hmm. and let's take as a given. We don't really know what the level of compensation that's possible is, but let's take as a starting point an estimate that it's six hundred calories a day. You can't your body kilocalories a day. You can't mm-hmm. compensate more than that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true, but let, let's as a, as a beginning yeah. point. Uh, you're running 10,000 kilo. You're running 10 miles a day. Yep. You're running 70 miles a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's you know, that's a lot. Um, people with faster math than me can figure out how many uh, kilometers a week that is. But that's seven. Uh, is it, yeah, 110. That's, about 110k a week. Yeah, yep. there you go. 110k a week. So if you're doing um, you know, a thousand calories a day running seven days a week obviously that's that's seven thousand calories a week all right you're burning a thousand calories a day on exercise <clears throat> your body compensates to that 600 so yeah. it's really you know, it's that the same as it's about 400 calories a day above a day. what we'd expect mm-hmm. from your weight and size um and so yeah you would be in that case you would be above average and to maintain body weight you would have to eat those 400 extra calories a day mm. compared to somebody who doesn't exercise at all. Um, and that's that's sort of what we're seeing with the ultra marathon runners. They seem to be elevated compared to sort of average folks. Um, mm-hmm. But you have to be at that level of expenditure before of, of activity before you're really seeing that kind of effect. All right. So I know I'm, gonna, I'm kind of getting stuck in here, but I did see in your paper, so 2018 <laughs> physiology paper, 
so someone on Twitter said, uh, any direct evidence like a randomized controlled trial to how that high volume exercise blunts metabolism and thus reduces weight loss? So you mentioned that paper, yeah? Mm -hmm. But in the paper, you said an important caveat in interpreting energy compensation data from exercise-based weight loss interventions is that total energy expenditure was not typically measured in these studies. And you also said, because energy intake was not measured in these studies either. So if they're not measuring, most of them aren't measuring total energy expenditure yeah. and they're not measuring food intake, is it a bit difficult to say yeah. that those studies were... Right, so that paper reviewed all the data, all the evidence for energy compensation. Mm -hmm. um, some of that evidence comes from weight change in exercise interventions, right? So how much do people's weights actually change as you get them exercising? Yeah. Um, and the fact that they don't change much at all, it has been described as energy compensation. Uh, and so I'm using the same term to describe the response in terms of our expenditures to exercise, so perhaps that's confusing. Um, but anyway, in those studies where you just measure weights, body weights, then yeah, you can't tell how much of that compensation is due to changes in intake versus changes in expenditure. And in the case of body weight in an exercise study, it's probably both. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. why, why would we expect it's just one? Yep. Um, in that paper as well, though, I talk about the papers, the studies that have been done. This is in, as of 2017 or 18 when I'm writing that paper. Studies that have been done that have measured daily energy expenditures uh, before and then after a few months of an exercise intervention. And what you see again and again, uh, we can do Gorin, Gorin and, and Pullman 1992. Um, that's an exercise intervention study in elderly folks. They found no change in daily energy expenditures from baseline to after a few months of the exercise intervention. Um, <clears throat> Midwest one, 2000 kilocalories a day intervention. Um, women in that, in that cohort had zero weight loss mm -hmm. after 16 months of extra, of supervised exercise. Yeah. Um, total energy expenditures were, no, were not statistically different from baseline, although, uh, you know, it, it was a variable response. So they trended upwards, but they, you know, there was no statistically st significant difference from baseline. Midwest 2, they had a 2,000 kilocalorie a week intervention and a 3,000 kilocalorie a week intervention. In the 2,000 kilocalorie a week intervention, again, total energy expenditures were not significantly, statistically significantly different mm -hmm. from baseline at 10 months. Uh, they were they were different at the 3,000 kilocalorie a week intervention. So maybe they were talking about the edges of constraint compensation there. I don't know. Um, but in both cases, they were less than you'd expect. So if you if you impose a 2,000 kilocalorie a week intervention on someone, mm -hmm. then I know what your daily expenditure ought to do, right? That I can divide by seven and figure yes, out what's yes. your daily expenditure. And it's it's not that. It's yep. it's considerably less. Uh, since that study, they've done another one, e mechanic where you have um, people who dose with two different levels of exercise, a sort of lower dose and a higher dose. Um, and the lower dose people, the total energy expenditure didn't change at all from baseline. The higher dose, uh, it changed, but not as much as you'd expect. And so you see this again and again and again, actually. Uh, you see it in animal studies all the time. Um, if you get an animal exercising in the lab, mice, you know, you lock the wheel for a while, then you give them the wheel to, to run on. They run and run and run, and you measure energy expenditures throughout the whole study. It doesn't respond, and it doesn't correspond to how much they're running. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I'm actually, I'm actually more than happy to agree that when, um, yeah. when people exercise, they do not lose weight as you, you would expect them to. And and yeah. I've actually, it's funny you said that because I have, have actually done. Well, it's not funny to say that, but said that, but um, I've actually seen that as well on rat studies where yeah. you run them on a treadmill or a running wheel or whatever. And and you find that they they haven't lost um, weight even though they haven't really like been eaten much more because you know you say yeah. okay so the idea obviously is you know you'd, you'd assume before this concept came along you just assume that many studies find and we know just anecdotally that many people exercise they don't lose weight but you just assume that they're eating more um, yeah. You know, but That's then part of it. I'll have yeah. to say, yeah, it probably is part of it. But but in the rats, we did indeed. I was like, something's wrong here because the rats didn't put on, didn't lose weight, but they weren't really eating much more either. And it's like, well, something's wrong. But you'd say it's, it's compensation. 
Yeah. And so, you know, I can't, I think, you know, for my mind, it's the evidence for compensation is kind of everywhere you bother to look for it. And, you know, whether or not it's 100% and what the, cons what the limits of it are and who compensates more and less and exactly what's happening under the hood. These are the really interesting questions for mm -hmm. me. Um, but, you know, it's just trying to get us as a research community to a place where we can acknowledge that it's happening <laughs> so that we yeah, can, yeah. then we can begin to address it i think that's the kind of uh -huh. the interesting point i think it's all cool i'm just i'm sorry if i'm coming up with a bit of a hard ass not but, at um, all no and i don't want to and i i just want to be a devil's advocate like, uh, yeah, yeah. defensive or anything um, like that I no just, no no you haven't uh, been actually. i think you haven't been um I, I i i like to discuss this stuff but i think distinguishing between i think it's really important actually in these discussions to distinguish between the observations that i think we can all agree on or the published mm -hmm data right and the why it's happening and exactly. you know i'm very happy to 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 go to the mats talking about look the data are the data there's conversation exactly. happening All and you can then do is look studies. when we get yeah. when we transitions into well why is it happening and how then that's more and inter interesting in some ways but i don't want to act like no, i you... know how it's happening because i don't know yet you know we'll you're definitely out. onto something and it's really really interesting <laughs> Hey, um, I think you know a guy, Trent Stellingworth. He was on the. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know him well, but we've had a couple of Zoom conversations. He seems like a good guy. Yeah, he, is. <laughs> he was on the podcast. It sounds like I'm flogging my podcast here, but he was on the podcast a couple ago, um, yeah. talking about his relative energy deficiency in sport. Mm. Right? Yeah, I think it's quite similar. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering about that because because the idea there is is he he sees as far as I understand. He sees reductions in, in resting metabolic rate, et cetera, when people are mm. not actually eating enough. But if they yeah. actually eat enough, then they don't see that reduction. Do you have any yeah. thoughts on that? Or Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that with you know elite athletes, you get two problems. You get, can, are you feeling enough to do what you're doing? And are you doing too much to even be able to fuel it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that overtraining syndrome um, which is one of the older versions of the, the, the red S stuff, uh, is, is basically the body's inability to fuel all of the tasks that it needs to fuel, right? Is a fuel that over training syndrome is in part anyway, um, a fueling system, a fueling problem. Uh, and so women, for example, who stop cycling, right? Stop ovulatory ovarian cycling and that's the body not investing calories in re reproduction mm -hmm. uh, because there's not enough calories to go around. You see, there's a, the hypogonadal male syndrome that Anthony Hackney here at UNC has talked about, same kind of thing um, that you see in elite athletes. And I think the, the red S stuff that Trent's worked on, I think there's elements of that too. Now you can take athletes in those situations. As I understand it, this Trent's the expert here, but as I understand it, in some of those studies, you try to fix the problem by feeding the, the athlete more, and it doesn't always work. It doesn't always resolve at least all the symptoms. Um, and I would say, right, because there's limits to how much just throughput you can get. And so you just sort of can't shove more energy into the system. At some point, you're limited in, in, in energy throughput. Okay, yeah. I think I can hear a bit of drilling in the background, but I've actually... Oh, got no. To, I've got Sorry, someone... that was a particularly loud... No, it was only, it was only yeah. low. I've got a guy mowing the lawn over there. Can you hear that? <laughs> I can't. No, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, yes. So the other day I saw one of your talks that was on online from the obesity conference. And mm -hmm. I think straight after you or before you was Lewis Holsey. Mm. And I know you've done work with him. Yeah. I, I think, unless I messed it up, I think he was saying, you know, with exercise, um, you generally have either no change in resting metabolic rate or with training or a slight increase. So I'm just wondering, how does that fit? Or do you agree with that? And how does that yeah, fit with your I, model? I mean, I, I've looked at some of those data too. I don't see it. I don't think there's any evidence of an increase of it. I mean, other, unless you're talking about if you add muscle mass, right? I mean, these are all sort of size corrected analyses right so yes yeah, so if, if you're you were, lean more more lean body mass i guess yeah mm -hmm. yeah um for your lean body mass i think if anything it's there isn't a big change in resting metabolic rate i think if anything it goes down but i don't know I, I think i think the in general you don't see a change um okay so yeah that's a challenge isn't it because that means that the compensation has to be coming from somewhere else um again these changes in how rmr changes throughout the day we're not capturing that when we measure it at one time in the morning. Um, we're not getting 
you know, it, it's, well, people used to blame this on changes in spontaneous activity, right? Mm -hmm. the, the Jim Levine neat idea, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. That becomes less of a plausible explanation, um, at least for the whole situation, the whole phenomenon, uh, as we get better with accelerometry, right? I mean, most of the, the neat idea that was sort of born from this lack of, of measurement. Uh, we didn't have accelerometry measurements. And so we said, well, sort of the person's exercising from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., but we don't know what they're doing the rest of the day. Well, now we do know what they're doing the rest of the day, right? Uh, that's what accelerometry gives you. And it's, it's imperfect, but um, it doesn't seem that that's always a good explanation for what's going on. Uh, it isn't perfect. It annoys me because when you have those hip, I think you quite often do the hip mounted ones and uh, yeah. you ride your bike and it says you're doing nothing and you're standing around, it's ever standing desk, it says you're doing nothing, you know? Yeah, no, we have a, yeah. we have this issue with uh, people who we work with in, you know, in Bolivia, for example, not my work, but uh, the uh, people who work with the Chimani and a lot of the work they do, they're either sitting or squatting and they're like doing all kinds of really hard exactly. work, you know, and you could never tell it from an accelerometer. It's, it's you're getting nothing for it. Yeah. Hey, just something totally different in your talk. Uh, I was talking about uh, your talk was a lot about diet. Yeah. I just want to, while I've got you here, this is another thing that did my head in. You said but when you cook potatoes, it like doubles the uh, energy density. How, how does that, how does that happen? Yeah, well, it's, those aren't my data that I'm, 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 uh, you know, I'm reading the published data in that slide, but so um, my, a friend of mine and a colleague, Richard Rangham, has done a lot of work on the advantages of cooking and the importance of cooking in human evolution. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he's, he trots out all these data all the time and, and they're all pretty interesting. Um, and one of them is, if you look at the amount of, uh, you know, digestible, metabolizable energy in a potato, okay. it, it's, it doubles. I mean, by, I'm sure it probably varies by the potato and that kind of thing. But, you know, on average, you get sort of twice as many calories per bite. And that's because if you don't cook it, then um, the those starches are, are locked up in a form that you can't digest. I don't I don't understand the chemistry of potatoes well enough to explain exactly how that happens so to such a huge degree. Um, but basically, you're you're processing the the starch and the fiber, the insoluble fiber. I believe it's crazy, huh? It all is. right. So um, all right. So we should eat our potatoes uncooked, and then you probably get a sore stomach. You get a sore stomach and you wouldn't put on as much weight, would you? But I don't know if that's uh, going to catch on. Yeah. So, okay. So just coming back, I guess we haven't talked about food intake that much. So, so I know your idea is that basically food intake is what determines your body weight. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. And then exercise, yeah. you're saying that the diet and exercise are two very different things, but they're both important. You're not saying exercise isn't important. Okay. Thank you're not you, saying right, exercise no. isn't important. You're saying diets, what's probably going to determine your body weight. And then exercise yep. is very important for your health, correct? Yep. So yeah, you, you're right. you're happy with that, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But I guess diet's important for your health as well. Um, sure. And exercise, yeah. you know, like people say, if, if you lose weight, then exercise is great to keep it off. Exercise is good to help keep your lean your lean mass up while you're losing weight with the diet. I mean, you know, these things interplay. But uh, in terms of just the clear message would be, if, if I had anything to do with it. We diet for weight and exercise for everything else. Diet for weight and exercise for everything else. Okay. So so me getting leaner when I was doing all that exercise that I've been doing is mainly because I'm actually eating less. <laughs> I mean Well, I mean it depends. Again, if you're uh, if you're exercising at uh, like Olympic levels, no, I don't know what you were doing. Uh, no. then... so just say I was on the six hundred, just say I was I was actually just magically doing 600 calories a day so you've compensated um, completely right yeah yeah so so the only reason i've lost weight is because i'm actually eating less now than what i was when i was doing nothing yeah i mean that's that would be the big uh again maybe there's some adjustment period when you start the exercise program that kind of thing <clears throat> but yeah the big change in your weight's been been your diet that's what i would argue my wife wouldn't agree <laughs> Right. We tend to go through that. We should look at my food bill, our food bill, since I've been I doing more exercise. That's another way. My of doing wife it. would tell you that um, my wife discovered this thing, bar three, which is kind of like a Pilates sort of thing, but it is much more intense. <clears throat> she loves it. And she's never been an exercise fanatic before, but she almost is now that she goes three or four times a week. And her weight has not changed a bit. 
and she yells at me all the time. <laughs> it's she your says, fault. It's my fault. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, if you didn't have that theory, she would be <clears throat> slim as. Yeah, that's right. So what about hunger? I mean, we've been going for a while here. Are you okay to keep going for a little bit or? I'm all right. At some point, I'm going to have to take about, uh, maybe if in about like at 4.30 of my time, if we can break by then, I can go get my kids and that kind of stuff. From How long is that away from now? How, 25 how minutes or so. Okay. We haven't talked much about um, hunger and <clears throat> yeah. appetite and whatever. Yeah. Can we talk about that a little bit? So, you know, that's another complication, I guess. But, um, yeah. Hmm. I mean, I don't know. It's not the work that I focus on in my lab, uh, mm -hmm. hunger and satiety. I am, you know, impressed by work that's been done uh, in other labs. I mean, if you, if Susan Holt, for example, uh, a researcher in Australia, looking at satiety indices and that kind of thing, you know, what, if I give you 100 kilocalories of food in different forms, uh, what keeps you feeling full the longest? I mean, I think that's really important work. Uh, that and other kind of research like that points to, you know, protein being particularly satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fats can be, fiber definitely is. Um, fats and carbs actually, I think, get you in trouble because they might be filling, but they, the calorie, the, the, the amount that they fill you up for how many calories they have is actually not a good ratio. Uh, I said that badly. But, you know, in other words, you want proteins and, and fiber to fill you up on fewer calories. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what do you think again about, okay, what another, I've, a lot of things do in my head at the moment. Um, so there's a guy here, Joe Pareto, and I know there's others that, that think similarly, that says, you know, if you try and lose, uh, this isn't really your area, but I'm just throwing it at yeah. you as maybe evolutionary or something, um, that if you lose a whole bunch of weight, um, usually they've done diet. So like, They've, they've actually been saying instead of just like having a small reduction in diet where you can't actually see anything, you know, there's no change in my hips, so they're going to give up. He's saying you give them like a really low calorie diet, they can actually see something happening and then they more likely stick to it. But the problem is then that these these um, hunger hormones uh, yeah. are just elevated. Basically, he's shown that they stay elevated, so you're just hungry the whole time until you yeah. get back to normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's in my uh, mind of the old like Rudy Libel stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's 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 kind of depressing. It makes it harder. But the idea I think that there is, if you do exercise, you're able to maintain it better. So it, it I don't know if it's affecting the hunger hormones or you it know? could be. I mean, I think uh, exercise seems to have a really important role regulating basically every system across the body. We shouldn't be yeah. surprised if it has an important role regulating energy intake and making us sort of getting you, you know, intake and expenditure in line. Um, I, you know, I, I know I feel better when I exercise. I like to exercise mm -hmm. and I suspect that I probably do less sort of stress boredom eating <laughs> when I'm, when I'm exercising, you know, there's, it's anecdotal, but, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, I think there might be a, a role there. Um, I guess yeah. the the other thing along those lines, which again, it's probably not your area, but I just while while I'm at while I've got you, yeah, and sure. it's kind of evolutionary uh, stuff, is is these people saying, you know, ah, oh, the reason people are overweight, they they can't help it because it's their genetics, they um uh, they, they've got yeah. more hunger hormones and whatever, and you tend to think, well, forty years ago, you know, the genetics was the same. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, I think all complex phenotypes are genes times environment, right? I mean, it's never just mm -hmm. one gene and it's never just the environment either. Uh, and I, I think it's a good point that 200 years ago, you know, there was no obesity crisis. Now there is. The genes are the same. I mean, 200 years isn't mm -hmm. enough time for you know, eight, yeah. eight billion people to have evolved. Um, but, you know, you look at where all the genes that affect BMI, associated with BMI, are active. They're all active in the brain, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's 201. Uh, and so that suggests to me, along with, you know, work like by Kevin Hall, looking at processed foods being really critical for yes. people over consume processed foods, uh, highly processed foods. You know, there's something about the way our brains are sensing the food around them, food available. Uh, and how much they eat and you know, how much they push us to eat and they're getting it wrong. You know, there's something about our food environment today 
Yeah. Okay. That kind of pushes us to overconsume. My, I have a, 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 a brother-in-law who's in finance and uh, I wish I was in finance sometimes because he seems to be doing a really good job of it. But he says, you know, <laughs> he has this analogy. He says, uh, uh, you know, the market's like everybody's standing chest deep in water in, you know, in the ocean. Yeah. And when the tide goes out, you see who's wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, everybody, so when the market loses money, yeah, you yeah. see who's been lying the whole time, you know? Right. Uh, and it's a bit like that, I think, with the food environment and obesity, right? So 20, 200 years ago, we were all chest deep. And you couldn't tell who had the alleles that were going to likely to push you to over. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And the tide goes out, and now we find out. Oh my gosh! Look at all those people who who are. That's true. So, so the genetics them. hasn't changed, but but it's yeah. fair to say that that when we were hunted and gatherers, we weren't getting this ultra processed food and all this yeah crap. You know, I think even uh, just two hundred years ago, I think even you know eighteen hundred exactly. That's true. I think it wasn't so bad. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and the other thing, I think someone else said. One of the, actually, I think anyway, someone said somewhere <laughs> that. Um, I think it might have been you that the Hasda they don't they tend to eat either like carbohydrate foods or their protein sort of foods they don't mix them together like yeah. we do so we've got the fat yeah. and the carbs all mixed together right yeah that's right mm -hmm. I mean there's no kind of there's no cultural rule against mixing your foods in the Hadza, but they just don't you know this isn't how they do it and so perhaps that's a, a key there too they're eating either eating you know a pile of tubers or they're eating you know a whole bunch of Berries that are eating meat. They don't, they don't usually animal. mix and match. Exactly. There's you know, no that, Hadza. There's no Hadza cuisine that's going to make it <laughs> make its way in, in a, the industrialized world. I don't think. Yeah. So the fact that we've got fat and carb. I think I know. I know what it was. It was a question at that conference. The fact that we've got mm. fat and carbohydrate mixed together nowadays. Um, yeah. Is 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 maybe doing strife to our genes. Yeah, and yeah. that's why you know ice cream is magical. Because <laughs> it's probably not meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's no ice cream in, in Hasda unless no, you guys exactly. turn up and give it. That's why I actually wonder sometimes is 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 are they going to get corrupted by our you know by the yeah, presence of that's not ones? a bad it's not a bad question, but mm -hmm. I think it misunderstands sort of just how mixed up all these cultures and, and, and people are. You know, I don't think there's any place in the world, um, uh, maybe outside of you know the deepest parts of the Amazon rainforest, uh, uh, where people really are you know, uncontacted, naive to the outside world kind of thing. Um, okay. yeah. But you don't so, turn yeah, up with fats of ice cream for them. I'm hoping. We don't. <laughs> but, you know, we share our food. We, we are, we're, we're, they're friendly with us. We're friendly with yeah. them. They let us try their food. We let us try them try our food. And But we haven't corrupted any of them yet, I don't think. I have not. Okay. So one thing I didn't say, and we should have probably said mm -hmm. right at the start, is it's kind of been like an assumption that, that, You've got your physical activity and then you've got these other things. So we've talked about basal metabolic rate. Do you want to just go through, because I know you talk about immune, you know, yeah. reproduction. Just Can you just talk a little bit about the different um, components that go into the energy? Yeah. So, you know, total energy expenditure, all the calories you burn every day, it, it has to fuel everything that you do. You know, so mm -hmm. you, you look at a physiology textbook and every chapter goes through some system and that system takes energy so whether it's your immune system or your brain and and you know or your kidneys or all of it i mean it all mm -hmm. takes energy um when we measure a basal metabolic rate that's your body's sort of lowest rate of energy expenditure you're there lying on a table thermo neutral fasted not stressed out um that's sort of the minimum amount of energy that your 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 uh, organs can burn but um, as you go through the day, you add on top of that uh, physical activity, so your muscles burn energy, um, and then also, you know, the arousal of being, of interacting with other humans, of being stressed out, of being, if you're, if you're in a cold environment, you need to stay warm, um, even just the basal metabolic rate itself fluctuates throughout the course of the day in a kind of circadian yeah. way. And so, you know, there's all sorts of things going on in your daily energy expenditure that we don't have a great way to measure. Um, activity, we can do pretty easily. Physical activity, we can do pretty easily. Basal metabolic rate, we can do quite reliably. The rest of it's hard to do. Yeah, but so you, so you, but um, some of those bits and pieces were, so you were saying the immune system. Immune function, stress reproduction. response, reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, you know the arousal sympathetic 
you know, your sympathetic nervous system be being on because you're you know, thermic effect of food when you eat. Oh yeah, sorry, thermic yeah, effect yeah. of food. You missed that one. The digestion costs of food. Interestingly, there, um, there's there's two components of that. So when you eat a meal, then there's the sort of uh, obligatory costs, is what they call it, of you know taking that food processing it down in your gut to something that it can get absorbed into your bloodstream or uh, into your lacteals. And then you take those nutrients and you break them down further. Um, and so all of those processes are kind of, they're obligatory. You can't not do them and they cost mm -hmm. energy. And then there's another component to that, uh, that we, you know, of energy cost of, of food um, that is facultative. So it's, it's actually using those nutrients to make proteins yes um and so you know and you can th that seems to be sympathetically motive uh mediated so if you block someone's if you give somebody propanolol you can actually block that second part of of the energy expended after you eat um anyway so that's, that's something i've been kind of thinking about recently and i'm, I'm interested in hey one thing uh, i was thinking and i'm sure you must do it but if someone's like exercising two hours a day or whatever you, I'm assuming you can you subtract off two hours of their basal metabolic rate, yeah, because you've got that exercise. Uh, it depends. I mean, so the hundred calories a day is sort of the hundred calories a mile of running, for example, that's over and above your basal metabolic rate. Yes, yeah, so you subtract so, off. So if you're measuring the VO2, for example, you'd subtract yeah. off the basal metabolic rate. Right? yeah to just get the the locomotor so during that we during that time of the exercise yeah 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 but that, that's what we wanted to get yeah cool all right well i hope i haven't gone uh too hard on you there um no, i think fine. what you do it's is just amazing and i was not really aware of all this so i was up sort of half the night getting my head around it all <laughs> um and i've got a thermic effect of chatting because i've I, I always get sweaty when i do this see look <laughs> so, at that there you go arousal arousal Sympathetic tone you're very arousing Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, and thanks for being a good sport. You didn't kind of outwardly get annoyed with any of my... No, I wasn't annoyed at all. It's a fun conversation. So um, and I, at any time, it was fun. All right. Is there anything we didn't talk about, you think? Uh, you know, uh, that's important. I mean, we covered a lot of bases. I don't know. Uh, no, I think... I, I don't think we missed anything. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, all yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on, mate. You bet. I'll see you later. See you later. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.